It is my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. John Oldham. Dr. Oldham is Senior Vice President and Chief of Staff for the Menninger Clinic. He is also on the faculty at Baylor College of Medicine in the Menninger Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, where he holds the Barbara and Corbin Robertson, Jr. Endowed Chair and is a Professor and Executive Vice Chair. Dr. Oldham is past president of the American Psychiatric Association and an internationally renowned expert on mental illness, its relationship to chronic physical illness, and integrated health care. We're very fortunate to have him here presenting for us today. Before Dr. Oldham begins, though, we have a couple of questions for the audience to answer. Um, you should have the first question um, should come up on your screen in just a moment. We'll give you a moment to select your answers. Just a few more seconds to see if we get a, a few more responses. And so, thank you. Um, the, so you can see here that I'm about 69% um, answer the question uh, correctly. Um, Dr. Oldham, is there anything that uh, you'd like to comment on? Um, yeah, just a quick word. Hi, everybody. Um, this is nice to see that people really uh, understand this. The only thing I would add is that this is correct that does not show genetics as one of the correct answers, but I would just modify that a little bit with the possibility that in the future that might be a correct answer because we're learning more and more about how we can activate genes and uh, by various behaviors and experiences in the environment, turn them on. And so they are perhaps modifiable, but they're not generally thought of in the way we are thinking about it here. Thank you. And we have just one more question for, for um, you all to answer. So we'll give you a moment to think about that and answer that one. We'll give folks just a few more seconds to get the answer, their answers in. When, when I do this at conferences, uh, we have nice music playing. <laughs> that, 
That's a good a good tip suggestion. for next time. <laughs> yes, great suggestion. So this this question was trickier. Um, we didn't have anybody have, get the entire answer correct. I'm sure some people got specific ones um, correct. Dr. Oldham, you know, any comments on this? Um, well, certainly depression is correct, and alcohol, and bipolar, and schizophrenia. Um, OCD is the one that surprises people probably most of those, but these are five out of the ten largest causes of illness of all of medicine. So this sort of this is from the Global Burden of Disease uh, World Health Organization report, and this was kind of the headline of the report was the hidden burden of neuropsychiatric disorders. And I'll show you a slide about that in a minute. Great, thank you. So we're going to go ahead and pull the PowerPoint um, slides back up, and um, it's all yours, Dr. Oldham. Okay, as soon as I see it, there we go. All right, so let me get going here. Okay, so thank you for inviting me to join you, and I will be going through these uh, and trying to explain the material. Um, absolutely send a note in if you have a question or are confused about any of it and we may have a little time at the end to take some additional questions. We'll see how it goes. Um, here's the first slide and this is actually from the National Institute of Mental Health which really just tries to display the enormous complexity and challenge in all of medicine and certainly in psychiatry because we operate all the way from the genetic level to the molecular cellular level to interconnected brain systems and neural networks to individuals and each individual is unique and each individual however does not live on an island but lives in a social context and so all of these are critically important parts of what we have to try to think about um, in the area. This is the report that I just mentioned, the Global Burden of Disease, um, and this is from um, the World Health Organization and the Harvard School of Public Health. And it's been a really important report and it's been updated pretty regularly. This is what the quiz you just got uh, refers to, and this was an early report, but it's pretty consistent over time. And you can see that out of the ten, five out of ten are in the mental health substance abuse area. Other things are anemia, falls, um, congenital concerns, osteoarthritis, but this was a big surprise to the authors of this study. This is a more recent update of that same um, World Health Organization look, and this is from 2008, and here you see again, it's shown a little bit differently, that neuropsychiatric disorders very strongly head the list of the most uh, burdensome of all disease categories. And that may surprise you, but um, perhaps not. But more than cardiovascular, more than cancer, um, other major things like respiratory diseases or digestive diseases. So these are, in fact, far more prevalent and far more burdensome than people necessarily realize. This is another slide that's really interesting. Um, it shows a set of different types of categories of disorder in different colors, but the headline tells you, and this shows you, that mental disorders are the chronic diseases of the young. Uh, as you see, they peak around about age 20. There's a study that was reported uh, a few years ago that was just quoted in a presentation I was at from the uh, director of the National Institute of Mental Health. And that study shows that the average age of onset for all mental illnesses is age 14. So that's pretty sobering because these are things that um, start early and one of our challenges is to work hard on prevention and early intervention. How heritable are mental disorders? This shows you a range of selected disorders and you see that the black bar refers to monozygotic twins and the light bar to dizygotic or fraternal twins. And of course the monozygotic share exactly the same gene pool and so this is much more likely to be genetic. And you can see autism is highly genetic, bipolar as well. 
schizophrenia as well. Major depressive disorder is, in fact, significantly heritable, um, but not so much uh, compared to just the general population. Macular degeneration, diabetes, hypertension, and irritable bowel syndrome are all less um, in terms of the population prevalence. Um, some of them have a higher heritability. But the most important point from this is just to show you that there is, in fact, very significant heritability to most conditions. And there are others not on this list. One of my areas of interest is in personality disorders, and you might be surprised to know that that is, in fact, moderately uh, heritable in about the same category as major depression. This is from Tom Ensel, who's the director of NIMH. And he just suggests that we have to think about mental disorders a little bit differently. First of all, that they are brain disorders. The brain is the organ of the body uh, where the problem is with mental disorders, and we need to understand that there is a biological basis for these disorders. They start early, as we showed you a minute ago. Uh, they're developmental disorders. And as with other kinds of conditions, they result from complex genetic risk plus experiential factors. Let me give you an example of that. If you have, let's say, two adult men in their early 20s, who have a moderate risk of developing diabetes adult onset. One of them is a sports enthusiast who's very naturally athletic and very extensively continues his exercise and watches his diet. The other is not inclined to do that, doesn't use the best judgment in terms of the foods he eats, gets overweight. Um, the second person may develop early onset adult diabetes, um, not teen onset, but early in his adult life. The first will not. Both have the identical risk. That same principle of what's called the, the stress vulnerability interaction applies for mental disorders as well. Let's take depression as an example. Depression is, in fact, not a neurosis. When I was in training, Quite a while ago, I was taught that depression was a neurotic condition caused by unresolved conflicts, usually having to do with your family. Um, we know how off base that was now, and we know that depression is a complex medical illness. Among many things that depression does, it affects lots of parts of the brain, all of these parts labeled here are affected by the illness called depression. We see the results of depression in the kinds of attitudes and behaviors and uh, emotions that we're familiar with, such as the hopelessness and the suicidality, lack of appetite, uh, lack of sexual desire, inability to sleep. Those are end products of a biological condition. Uh, and how they, in fact, affect how we proceed. One thing that we've learned would have been very surprising to me in my early training years, and that is that depression is an independent risk factor for cardiac death after a heart attack. This slide shows you mortality, meaning the percent of deaths is on this vertical axis, and time is on the horizontal axis, and what you see in the red bar is patients who are not depressed who are recovering from a heart attack, and there's not a lot of mortality. Patients who also had a heart attack but have depression as well show a quite significant increase in mortality, and this is not increase from suicide or anything related to the depression. This is, in fact, cardiac death. So that's pretty amazing. Here's another way to look at it. Ordinarily, we have normal. This little cell here uh, on the left is a neuron or a nerve cell in the brain. And they're genetic factors that uh, influence the proliferation and development of those brain cells. So that's the normal process. 
However, if you have some heritable risk for depression and you hit the stressful precipitant, that can do all kinds of things, not just to the brain and to the emotions, but to uh, the rest of the body. Stress hormones can get increased. This is something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, but it's an important hormone that is, in fact, diminished. Even the brain cells can shrink, and some of them even die. And other things that happen are shown down here in terms of um, other insults that can make it worse. The good news is that antidepressants, and, and notice it says and or psychotherapy, can reverse these body and metabolic effects uh, and resume uh, and return these abnormalities to a normal level. In quality of care, how well is depression cared for? This is a study by Wayne Caton uh, a couple of years ago and showed that in primary care, if your family doctor or your primary care doctor uh, is where you go for for help, depression is only identified accurately a quarter to half of the time. And even in those, when they're diagnosed, very few receive an adequate dosage of treatment or continue treatment an adequate length of time. Actually, about 40% in this study discontinued their medication in four to six weeks, um, and that was, in fact, an example of not continuing the treatment long enough for it to do the important uh, benefit, to receive the important benefit that you could get otherwise. So about half of patients with depression referred to primary care uh, failed then to follow up and see specialists. So this is an area we have to really work on, and it's what I really strongly support, and the title of this talk is on integrated care. We need to be in the room partnering with primary care, family medicine, to all be working together. This is a study also by Wayne Caton um, in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at collaborative care. And this would be an example of a partnership and integrated care for people with depression, but also with other chronic illnesses. And this was a study of patients with depression and poorly controlled diabetes, heart disease, or both. And this was a very careful uh, design for the study, so it's called random assignment uh, along with a usual care control group. And the intervention group, um, which is the group that in fact received medically supervised nursing supervision along with the primary care physician looking at guideline-based care for both the medical and the uh, depression conditions. And that intervention group showed, in fact, greater response than the control group at one year for your cholesterol level, hemoglobin, blood pressure, depression score, the need, how frequently you have to adjust insulin, the other medications such as antihypertensives and even antidepressants, increased quality of life, and increased satisfaction with care. So this is the kind of study, and there are others like it, just over and over tells us that we need to, in fact, oops, didn't mean to do that, yes I did, okay, it, that, that we need to work closely with our uh, partners in family medicine and primary care, and that would be true for other specialty uh, fields as well. This is a study by um, uh, the Institute of Medicine, which is a major organization that oversees health care. It's called Crossing the Quality Chasm, and underlines in a very, very elegant report that we aren't at the point we need to be in terms of healthcare quality. One of their conclusions in that study was that only about a quarter of the studies they looked at documented adequate adherence to specific recommendations in clinical evidence-based practice guidelines. So we don't partner very well in medicine, and when we do take care of patients, maybe there are a lot of reasons for it. The sort of pace of medicine is pretty daunting these days, but we 
do know what good treatment is, but we don't follow what we know as often as we should. I was a member for about 10 years uh, representing the American Psychiatric Association of a group called the Physician Consortium for Performance Improvement. And our sort of motto was performance measures by physicians for physicians. Um, and this was a very interesting exercise where there were evidence-based performance measure sets that were developed for all kinds of conditions. And you can see some of them listed here. When I first joined this group, there were no guidelines, no performance measure sets in mental health or behavioral health at all. And I suggested we needed to do some and recommended the first one to try would be major depressive disorder. Um, they then, to my surprise a little bit, were very receptive, said we know that depression is destabilizing. If you have something like diabetes or other conditions, we need you, oh, when can you start? So they asked me to chair the work group to develop a performance measure set for, first of all, depression in adults, and then we did a second one for depression in children and adolescents. And then since then, there have been a few other things, such as the bottom one here, substance use disorders, that have come along. Um, and these are now being um, endorsed by what's called the National Quality Forum as the uh, applications are submitted. So that's really moving us in the direction of partnership with all of medicine and being on the radar screen. Well, one area that is an important area of overlap is Alzheimer's disease, and it is enormously prevalent. This is from a good friend of mine, Dilip Jeste, who's at the University of San Di uh, California, San Diego, and he's a geriatric psychiatrist and researcher, and points out that the prevalence of Alzheimer's in 2000 was 4.5 million, projected in 2050 to be 16 million. And the kinds of things that accompany Alzheimer's are depressive symptoms, sometimes psychosis, and certainly a lot of agitation. I will just sidebar for a minute and point something out. One of the things that frequently gets said about psychiatry is that we don't have lab tests, uh, and so it's not easy to recognize depression because you can't take a blood sample and get the result. Well, people don't always pause to understand. There are two areas of medicine where there are actually no lab tests at all that are available to diagnose. One is Alzheimer's disease, and the other is Parkinson's disease. Nobody questions the reality of those illnesses. There are no lab tests for them, uh, and we don't sometimes pause to realize that it's not just in psychiatry where we have um, very clear and recognized illnesses, uh, and these are biological illnesses and brain disorders part of the body. Sticking with the forecast for a minute, most older mentally ill persons mostly receive their treatment in primary care. That's where there's a very inadequate level of diagnosis, and the treatment is under treatment, as I showed you in the earlier slide. By the time you're in the elderly range, um, many of your family members may have died. There may be added problems, such as poverty, generally poor medical care. And so you have the dual social stigma of a mental illness, which always has the just adhesive problem of stigma that surrounds it all the time, added to which you're in the elderly population, and that's got its own um, problems. If you look at what professions are needed in geriatrics, again, currently you can see the supply of geriatric psychiatrists, psychology, social work, and nursing. Just look at nursing. We have 11,000 estimated currently. In 2020, we're going to need 1.3 million. So this is an enormous uh, challenge and problem as we look ahead. Looking at a report that the American Psychiatric Association put together a few years ago on an, an integration of psychiatry and primary care, uh, these were some of their suggestions that about 20% of patients in primary care have diagnosable psychiatric disorders. Actually, about 50% are there for behavioral uh, symptoms and stress symptoms, things like insomnia, general fatigue, 
headache. But we still cling to our differentiation language and call some of them mental and some of them physical and think that they're different. And I guess one of my, what I hope will be your take home message today is that these are not different. Um, they're all very, very much in the same category. Some of the concerns um, that are out there, and this is from a report, these initials at the bottom stands for, stand for the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors. Um, so this is an organization of state hospitals throughout the country. And if you look at individuals with serious mental illness, SMI, you find some pretty upsetting and serious things. One is that these people die 25 years earlier than the general population. 60% of these premature deaths in people with such things as schizophrenia are due to medical conditions such as cardiovascular, pulmonary, and infectious diseases. Then there is a high prevalence in people with serious mental illness of modifiable risk factors. These are some of the things on the list of that question you answered earlier, especially obesity and tobacco use. If you look at those modifiable risk factors in this table, obesity, smoking, diabetes, and hypertension, the estimated prevalence is pretty extreme. In patients with schizophrenia, it's about 50% with obesity, all the way up to 80% range for smoking, a substantial percentage of diabetes, and also hypertension. And you see similar figures in bipolar disorder, although smoking is not quite as extreme as it is in patients with schizophrenia. Here's another slide that shows patients with schizophrenia and co-occurring diabetes. The white uh, part of the slide shows diagnosed diabetes in the general population, and the red part shows diabetes in patients with schizophrenia in the population. So there is, again, a significant uh, elevation of the onset of diabetes in patients with this condition, reflecting those modifiable risk factors as the environmental precipitants for heritable genetic risk for things uh, such as um, diabetes. Here's another example uh, because there's a further complication for patients with schizophrenia, and that is the second generation antipsychotic medications uh, that are often prescribed for these patients can have an unfortunate side effect that's called the metabolic syndrome. And if you're taking those um, medications, you need to then be watching for risk factors for this development of this syndrome because it's a complication that then makes matters worse. Abdominal obesity is one thing to watch in terms of waist circumference. Your serum triglycerides, um, that, that's your sort of um, um, blood measure that you want to be sure you keep under control. We talk about cholesterol all the time, and you need to watch that and not let it get high, not let the blood pressure get high, and follow your fasting blood glucose. So all of these are measures. And things that if you have an illness such as schizophrenia and if you're on one of these medications, it's critically important to have a primary care or family medicine doc who can work with your psychiatrist and other providers to follow and track these conditions. Just take obesity, for example, and this is from a presentation by Dr. Stuart Yudowski who's chairman of the Department of Psychiatry here at Baylor, where I work. Um, and he says that among children and adolescents ages 2 to 19, about a third of boys, and almost the same for girls, are overweight or obese. And of those, one in six, 17% of all boys and 15% of all girls are obese. In comparison, children who were obese in the 70s um, weren't as prevalent, and in fact, it's gotten five times higher. 
In adults, millions of people are overweight or obese, uh, and actually huge numbers are actually, frankly, obese, not just overweight. So this is a huge problem. Um, what's the impact? The impact annually is estimated to be about $250 billion. Overweight adolescents have about a 70% chance to become overweight adults. And if these trends continue, it's estimated that by 2030, it would reach somewhere between 850 and 950 billion, or over 15, 16 to 18 percent of U.S. health care expenses overall, which is a pretty staggering set of figures. We have to do something about that. What are the other consequences of obesity? Cardiovascular conditions, an enormous higher rate of congestive heart failure, heart attack, blood clots, um, neurological conditions will follow if you have these kinds of um, deep vein um, occlusions. That will lead also to emboli that can create strokes and vascular dementia. Um, there are other things that are accompanying obesity, such as migraines. And you may be surprised, but it also, in fact, is a risk factor for breast cancer and other kinds of cancer. It's bad for you, is one way to summarize it. Likewise, endocrine conditions such as diabetes, menstrual disorders, infertility, um, these are all risk factors as well, or, or rather potential um, side effects of, of obesity or conditions that accompany obesity. Likewise, rheumatology and neuropsychiatry are concerns that you see elevated in patients with obesity. Now let's look from there to another one of these complicating conditions, and that's tobacco and smoking. This is from a presentation recently by Dorothy Hatsukami, who is a researcher looking at uh, tobacco use. She's at the um, University of um, uh, Illinois. And so this curve looks pretty good, or looks encouraging, because if you look and track all the way back from the early uh, 1900s, you can see a huge increase in smoking. Um, but then with uh, some of the wake-up calls that began to happen and prevention efforts, you can see a drop. And so that looks good, but then if you look closely, what you're seeing as a problem is that, in fact, adult smoking has leveled off in the last few years and is not changing much. So we've reached a lower level, but we're plateauing. And so that's a, that's a potential problem. There are about 45 million smokers in the US, over a billion worldwide. One out of two smokers will die of tobacco-related disease, half of them. It's a third of all cancer deaths over 87% of lung cancers. This is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, 79%, and 32% will die of congestive heart disease. There are about half a million tobacco-related deaths each year in the U.S., and about 6 million deaths worldwide. And of course, the cost is staggering, over $133 billion per year in the U.S. This slide uh, at the talk that she recently gave, uh, and I asked her to let me borrow these slides. This one just amazed me. This is a full body portrayal of the health consequences causally linked to smoking. Some of them we know, but we don't like to think about, but there they are, such as stroke. But look at the other things, macular degeneration, these in red are the ones uh, that, in fact, have more recently been recognized as related causally to smoking. But other things, such as cancers, the whole column on the left have been identified as cancers that are secondary to smoking. On the right, other things like aneurysms, heart disease, pneumonia, tuberculosis, diabetes, reproductive problems, 
orthopedic problems, sexual function problems, arthritis, and inadequacies and, and major difficulties with your immune status. So if, if you wonder, is, is smoking that bad? The answer is very clear, yes. And don't forget, I just showed you the slide a few moments ago that patients, for example, with serious mental illness called schizophrenia smoke in about the 80% range. So when we think about how come they're 25% more um, or shorter lifespan for patients with serious mental illness, there is one of your answers. One out of three smokers who experiment go on to regular smoking, 44% try to quit, and only 4% achieve it. That reminds me of the Mark Twain quote that I'm sure you all know who said, it's easy to stop smoking. I've done it many times. It's very hard to stay that way. Current treatments are associated only with about 25% long-term success rates. So these are things that we really need to keep working on very hard. Here's a re another look at what the relationship is to tobacco use and serious mental illness. Prevalence is two to three times that in the general population. There is a greater severity of the dependency, a lower likelihood of being able successfully to stop. And here again is that shorter lifespan, but in this case it's identified as just due to smoking and its effects. What do we do about it? Well, you could say everybody should stop. We already see the statistics and we're not very good at uh, doing that. So there's a new way of thinking about it that, uh, again, Dr. Hatsukami was talking about as a harm minimization approach. We should think about reducing the most harmful products and reduce the harm of the remaining products, one of which is what's called smokeless tobacco. Snus is one example of that shown here. These are different types of preparations. Um, there are lots of sort of reasons why these don't appeal to many people because uh, you, you usually chew these in your mouth. But if you look again at an example of the difference um, from the yellow bar, this snus use compared to actual smoking and compared to never smoking, Look at lung cancer, which is enormous, pancreatic cancer. And if you use this alternative as a way to continue to have some kind of nicotine use, uh, you drop your risk really enormously. So that's a way of doing what she's describing as harm minimization. What about e-cigarettes? Because those are growing in use, and you see them all over the place. Well, this shows you, again, the percent of the United States adults who have ever used um, and the increase just in a one-year span from 2010 to 2011 from less than 10 percent doubled to 20 percent of smoking. Former smokers, um, that's increasing, that's good. Never smokers is staying level. That we would like to see as the steepest curve so that that could go up, but that's not what we see. Um, here you can see e-cigarette use. Um, is it controlled? No. She described it as a wild west. There are no warning labels, no labels, no restrictions, limited indoor air regulations, um, no restrictions to sale to minors. So although we know that it in fact minimizes the harm of regular smoking, it's too soon to know what kind of additional risks we're going to see of this kind of use. I must say that I took a trip a couple of years ago to the Middle East to Doha, Qatar, and in all the outdoor cafes uh, there were hookahs all over the place and everyone was smoking, men and women. Uh, and that's in fact another form, but it's even higher risk uh, and known to be. Where do you get what's called electronic nicotine dispensal or, or dispersing systems. 
ENDS, well, anywhere you want. A drugstore, Costco, Walgreens, um, it's easy to find. What are the risks and benefits of e-cigarettes? Well, it's more toxic than just medicinal nicotine. Um, we don't know really what the levels are. We know that it's less than regular smoking. Um, it doesn't actually satisfy, satisfy a lot of smokers, so they end up doing both. So that makes it worse. And there may be other later, um, if learn, we may later learn that there are other uh, side effects that are not uh, welcome. The benefits, though, are that it's less toxic than cigarettes, and if that's all you do and you don't smoke cigarettes as well, that's a benefit. It's widely available. Uh, it may help you get to eventual cessation and, of course, reduces cigarette smoking itself. This is the Surgeon General's report in 2014, which indicated the burden of death and disease from tobacco use is overwhelmingly caused by cigarettes and other combusted products. Rapidly eliminating their use will dramatically reduce this burden, just states the obvious when you see the kind of data I just showed you. Well, how can we improve total health for people with serious mental illness? Well, we need to develop a wellness approach. We need to reduce or eliminate modifiable risk factors, such as smoking, alcohol consumption, poor nutrition, obesity, lack of exercise, unsafe sexual behavior, IV drug use. All of these are things that we need to work hard to minimize or reduce. And one way to do that is I'm taking us back now to um, the importance of integrated care. We need to have very close collaboration with psychiatrists and they need to be either team supervisors or closely allied consultants um, or I would prefer actually at the table uh, in the same building right down the hall with the primary care doc and the family care doc. There are several approaches and organizational strategies. One is fully integrated. This is the one I just described, which I really prefer. So you have a mental health substance abuse expert in the building with primary care. There's a partnership where you can be in the community but available uh, immediately to primary care docs. And the third and probably less, less useful but nonetheless still important is to have a good referral network that's um, very widely used. Effective collaborative care can be accomplished. These are some of the ways. You use team-based care. You involve all kinds of professionals on the team, social workers, nurses, psychologists, psychiatrists, other counselors, pharmacists. And population-based care means that you can have recording of the care in what's called a registry. So you make sure that you cover the whole population and don't have anybody fall through the cracks. Then you have to have measurable treatment goals, track and follow how the patients do, make sure that the clinical goals are achieved, and use evidence-based treatment approaches. That's a good set of principles. It's not at all easy to do, but that's what our goals should be, and we should keep them in front of us. The American Psychiatric Association developed a set of principles that were approved by the Board of Trustees, and they included the right to diagnosis and treatment, look at the whole person, have timely access, full parity, family-centered, community-based, culturally sensitive, integrated with medicine and primary care, use dignity and respect, confidentiality, least restrictive setting, integrated with substance abuse treatment, then look at prevention and early recognition, and of course our ever-present goal to overcome stigma and have an adequate workforce, especially child psychiatry, and that's where we have a big shortage. This is a quote I like from a combination of the American Association of Family Practice, the American Board of Family Medicine, um, and the American uh, I forget the name of this, but it's another organization of family medicine. But just see what they say. 
science has rendered untenable the artificial division of people into parts, particularly mental and physical parts. Given that over half of primary care patients have a mental or behavioral diagnosis or symptoms, that are significantly disabling. And given that every medical problem has a psychosocial dimension, and given that most personal care plans require substantial health behavior change, a primary care uh, medical provider or medical home would be incomplete without behavioral health care fully incorporated into its fabric. A whole person orientation simply cannot be imagined without including the behavioral together with the physical. Um, I would say bravo uh, is my view about that quote. And let me just finish up my remarks with a look at the special complication of the problem of stigma, because that is there and badly there. The Surgeon General's report indicated that about one in five Americans experiences a mental disorder. About 15% have it in one year um, that also occurs with substance use, and I think that's a conservative estimate because people don't always report that. Nearly half of all Americans who have a condition don't seek treatment, and that's our own hesitation and our own stigma that we carry around with us, and I'm not, not talking about all the population out there. This is also true in professionals, in physicians, in all of medicine. But effective treatments are the most effective antidote to that stigma. This is from um, Ben Druss, who's at Emory, who says the bottom line in terms of our, this whole focus on integrated care is to ensure that mental health has a room in the medical home or as a partner in the, in the, affordable, in the accountable care organization, which is set up by the Affordable Care Act. We have to all work together to identify common risk factors and to focus on prevention. Then we have to increase our research to track patients with comorbidity as a health disparities population. And this is the serious mental illness population that needs to be carefully addressed. And then we need to study the effectiveness of our different treatment models. So that's uh, the end of my presentation. Um, appreciate your attention and your interest. And we have some time now. If you do have questions, um, I'm not seeing any on my screen, but maybe I'm missing them. Um, Alejandro, can you advise? I'm not seeing any right now, but we'll give people a couple of minutes. Definitely. I'm not seeing any either, but um, you can give people a couple of minutes if you do have questions. Um, Please, uh, please go ahead and put them in the chat box. And I do see a, a, a comment, and I completely second this comment. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Oldham. Well, thank you. So we'll give people a couple of minutes to, um, to type their questions. And Je Jessica or Dr. Oldham, would you be able to click just back up to maybe the last slide? Sure. Let's thank see. you. Oh, uh, wait, oh. Oops, wait. I think Jessica's got doing it. That's okay, fine. that's fine. Thank you. Or this first slide is, is fine too. I just okay. we are going to have. Um, I do see one question um, that came in, and it's actually on uh, from slide twelve. So maybe Jessica can, if you could scroll down to slide twelve. This question. Um, is asking about what viruses uh, most commonly cause the neur um, neuronal insult that contributes to depression. I'm looking for the slide here. I think she's get, yeah, we're getting there. Oh, here. Um, actually, what this means to imply is that not that these conditions listed at the bottom necessarily contribute specifically to depression per se, but that they can be um, added insults to the nervous system so that if you have already depression, then these things are going to make it worse. So if you have for some reason um, a reduced blood flow to the brain, which is what the first one, hypoxia, ischemia would be, 
let's say if you have atherosclerosis or you have a heart condition that leads you to have um, lower blood pressure than you need and you have um, episodes of um, fainting and um, feeling dizzy that can make matters worse. Low blood sugar, hypoglycemia can do the same. And neurotoxins just mean that some substances um, can be harmful to the nervous system. Uh, and viruses really means that there are a whole series of virus viral conditions that can debilitate you uh, and that will further um, in, um, add to the stress overall that you're already in the middle of from a severe depression. So the depression is affecting all those parts of the body that I showed you in that other slide. Uh, and if you have other things such as a viral condition that reduces your immuno immunosuppression, your capacity to fight um, other conditions um, and to fight viruses, um, then that's a problem. And you may be more vulnerable and susceptible to a viral condition or another infection because your immune system is compromised by the depression itself. Thank you. Let's see. Any other questions? Uh, here's an, uh, here's a, um, we have, do have another question coming up, or another couple of questions, actually. The next question asks, um, wanted to ask um, uh, any, about any research you might be aware of regarding um, neuromacular disorders and if they might be a risk factor um, in depression. I see that, and it's not neuromacular, it's neuromuscular. Oh, I'm, I misread. Yes, thank you. <laughs> right. Thank you. Right. Um, I don't know of any, but, I'm, but um, there are some that talk about uh, problems that are um, of orthopedic in nature, and um, that certainly could tie into neuromuscular disorders. Um, I don't know that I'm your best expert to answer that, so that would be something that would be uh, important to talk to some of our primary care and family practice colleagues. Um, and I suspect the answer is yes. But I, but I don't specifically know about that myself. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then um, we do have another question. Um, what are the options for dual inpatient treatment of um, primary care, physical health, and behavioral health conditions, um, allowing for payment regardless of which condition is primary? Boy, I wish I had an answer to that one. Uh, I, don't, I didn't emphasize it on one of the slides that I showed, but um, all of our um, efforts to move to effective integrated care are challenging, but one of the reasons they're particularly challenging is that we don't have integrated funding. And the federal aid funding system, such as Medicare and Medicaid, keep these separate. So if we have integrated provision of care, picture, for example, if it's like a a family of providers accomplishing what your small town general practitioner accomplished years and decades ago. My grandfather was a small time doctor in Oklahoma and he took care of everything all the way from depression to delivering babies and setting bones if somebody has a broken bone. We want to have all the experts in one place so that it's one stop shopping but we don't have one-stop funding, and so that's an enormous problem. We've got to work on this. There are many, many efforts underway. The American Psychiatric Association is working hard to try to keep that very much on the front burner uh, as we collaborate with uh, government and other funding aspects of the reform in healthcare. But we have to really keep working at it because it hasn't happened yet. Thank you. Yes, definitely a very important work ahead of all of us. Um, I have a couple of just logistics questions. Um, somebody asked about receiving a certificate. Um, there, we are not providing CEUs for this webinar. If you do need a certificate of completion, um, I've uh, typed in an email address there. You can email Gabby, our program coordinator, at uh, gsolis, G-S-O-L-I-S, at mhahouston.org, um, and we can, um, we can send you one if you need that. And then um, we are recording the PowerPoint, and um, we will, um, with Dr. Oldham's permission, we'll make that available. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Happy to. Great. Thank you. Let's see if any other questions are coming up.
Not seeing any other questions, just give people all a few more seconds and then um, we can wrap up. So, Dr. Oldham, thank you so much uh, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. I mean, we've already had some feedback here about um, how many, uh, how useful people found the um, presentation, and I'm sure we'll hear some more of that in the evaluations. And thank you all of you for taking um, this time at your lunchtime today to join us. Um, as um, the webinar ends, um, you'll be directed immediately to a brief evaluation that will pop up. And again, we do use all of that um, information to plan future um, webinars and events. So we would greatly appreciate your taking a few minutes um, to fill it out um, either now or um, if you really don't have time now in the next day or so when it comes to you via email. As uh, soon as and I, and I, Alejandra, I'm going to be signing off. Just thanks uh, very much. Uh, for inviting me to join you. It was a privilege and a pleasure, and thanks to all of you who were listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Oldham. Take okay, bye-bye. Um, as I mentioned, as soon as the recording of the webinar is ready, we'll um, send you that information. And I've, I think a couple of people have asked about the, the slides themselves. Um, I'll check with Dr. Oldham, and with his permission, we can share um, either a PowerPoint or a PDF of the slides with you. And finally, um, I just uh, wanted to let you know or remind you that today's webinar was actually the first in a series of four webinars uh, providing education on physical health issues um, for an audience of behavioral health providers. And we'll be sending you information about upcoming webinars in the series. So we hope you'll be able to join us for those as well. Thank you, everybody, and um, enjoy the rest of your day.